Welcome to the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation monthly Meet the Scientists webinar series. I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein, President and CEO of the Foundation, and your host and moderator for today's webinar. Today, Dr. Jan Fawcett will present a webinar entitled Dopaminergic Medications in Treatment-Resistant Depression. The Brain and Behavior Research Foundation is dedicated to funding research around the world to identify the causes, improve treatments, and ultimately develop cures and preventative techniques for mental illness. The foundation has awarded approximately $320 million in research grants for more than 25 years. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Jan Fawcett. Dr. Fawcett is a professor of psychiatry at the University of New Mexico School of Medicine. He is a leader in research on affective disorders and suicide prevention, as well as public education and outreach programs. He's the principal investigator of a major five-year National Institute of Mental Health study, which is being conducted at Rush Medical Center in collaboration with investigators at Vanderbilt and the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Fawcett helped found the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance, which created and presented him with the Dr. Jan Fawcett Humanitarian Award. Among his efforts to help educate the public on mental illness, he is a co-author of the book New Hope for People with Bipolar Disorder. He was also the chair of the Mood Disorders Work Group and a member of the task force for DSM-5. Dr. Fawcett is the recipient of the Foundation's 2005 Bipolar Mood Disorders Prize for Outstanding Achievement and Effective Disorders Research, and is a founding member of the Scientific Council. The Council identifies the most promising ideas to fund with Foundation grants each year. This will be an interactive event. We'll start with Dr. Fawcett's presentation followed by a question and answer period. To submit your questions, please use the questions tab of the webinar control panel. You can submit your questions throughout the presentation. As your moderator, I will present your questions to Dr. Fawcett and we will address as many as possible. And now I'm pleased to present Dr. Jan Fawcett. Jan, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Bornstein. <clears throat> It's a sad irony that we're having this seminar, webinar, uh, the day after uh, we heard about the loss of Robin Williams to a, to a depression. And uh, this is the problem we have with treatment-resistant depression, uh, very high rates of, of uh, suicide risk and, and suicide. And uh, this country is lost, and this world has lost a wonderful person from this disorder. Uh, now, usually when an academician gives a, a talk, he uh, lists all of his conflicts. For instance, uh, if I were receiving... I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, we need to see your screen if you can uh, uh, click on oh, share. Oh, 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 you're not seeing it. Okay. Okay, I'll go back. Excellent. To now, perfect. Excellent. Thank you so you much. see it now? All right. Okay. <laughs> uh, where was I? I, I, uh, I wanted to uh, uh, list my conflicts, which most academicians do. Uh, for instance, if I were receiving half a million dollars a year as a consultant for a specific drug company, you would want to be very suspicious about anything I said about that drug. Uh, my conflicts are only one, uh, which I'll list here, which is my recent novel, Living Forever. Uh, I have no other conflicts with any other companies or anything. I don't do any consulting anymore. So uh, uh, this is my only conflict, and, uh, it, uh, and I'll move on from here. We've listed a number of abbreviations that are occurring in this presentation because of the need to get things on slides. We use abbreviations frequently. Uh, uh, PPX is, uh, is primipexol uh, uh, with an E on the end of it. Uh, and uh, 
you can use this if you if you get the slides to figure them out if you have trouble with the with the abbreviations. Now, failed remission and high relapse rates are common in mood disorders, and uh, uh, one of the largest studies of this was the Start E study, which admitted uh, approximately 2,000 patients. And it's one of the few patient studies that showed a sequence of treatment. In other words, if a patient failed one medication, which was citalopram, was the first medication here, uh, they, were, they were then offered other steps, up to four different steps of treatment. And I'm not going to go over all those steps for this, uh, with this kind of detail, but they were essentially combinations and other drugs that are more difficult to use. But you'll notice with citalopram, there's a 36.8 remission rate. And the overall remission with steps, four steps of treatment was 67%. That means that, that uh, right at the get-go, 33% or a third of the sample were resistant to four steps of treatment. However, if you when you treat depression, you have to also think about the maintenance of, of uh, this remission over time. Uh, and so this study did four-month recovery rates, or, or recurrence rates. And they had a recurrence rate of 40% in the group that, went, that, that, had the high re, that had the initial high remission rate, up to 71% if this patient required four steps of treatment. So if you put this together in terms of recovery rates and figure the 67% that recovered um, initially times the 60% that were still uh, recovered at, at four months, you only get a 40% recovery rate at four months. Now, I don't consider that very good, and, and I don't think you would either. Um, the, the, uh, the official definition of recovery is no episode of depression for six months. This study did the, did the uh, study at, at four months. And the curve was still dropping. So if you used officially recovery for six months, you'd see that, uh, that th these patients were, w w these rates are even worse than this, maybe 30%. So this is the problem that I'm addressing. Is the, is the problem with, with getting people to respond to treatment and to keep them well for six months. Uh, the, the, the same is true with bipolar dis disorder or, or bipolar depression in bipolar patients. In fact, it may be a little worse because there's a real question how well antidepressants work in bipolar depression. Notice this 25% six-week response from this one study I've quoted. Uh, there's, a, uh, there's this initial assumption was made that, that uh, patients with uh, bipolar disorder would respond with their depression the same as any depression. But this may not be true uh, in, in terms of antidepressants. This drug, catiapine, that you may have heard of is Seroquel, has the highest, which is really an antipsychotic. It was developed to treat schizophrenia, but it really has the highest rate of response uh, in terms of the studies done, higher than any of the antidepressants, interestingly enough. Now, there's been a recent flurry of interest in ketamine, uh, which is a, a, a hallucinogenic an, an anesthetic, which was found to have the, a, an amazing response rate uh, when it's given intravenously in low doses. Um, and patients with severe suicidal ideation would, it, would find that their ideation was gone in 45 minutes or an hour after the infusion started. The only problem is this response only lasts uh, up to seven days, maybe up to two weeks in some patients, and then the, the depression recurs. So they have not figured out how to make this response last. Uh, 
and, and but it does show uh, it's a proof of concept that it is possible chemically to re, re, to a miraculously change depression and so people are really excited and much research is going on to try and to try and exploit this finding now there's a a, a medication called modafinil which is a stimulant which works in antidepressants works as an antidepressant only in bipolar disorder and then there's the drug premipexol which I'm going to be talking more about which Goldberg first used in uh, in the treatment of bipolar depression with a 67 percent response versus 20 percent placebo response which is a which is a pretty uh, big difference most studies have up to 30 to 35 percent placebo responses of depression um, this is this will compare with ECT which is electroconvulsive therapy which is considered by many people the ultimate treatment uh, uh, they got a, a two-thirds response but the follow-up was not done in this study and when studies are done with follow-up they show about a 50 percent relapse rate so what I'm trying to tell you is that uh, our treatment of depression is not as good as we'd like it to be. Some people do respond and stay well, but it's, it's a, there are many people who are treatment resistant that don't respond to these treatments or relapse on them. Now I want to introduce a concept called number needed to treat. Uh, this is what clinicians uh, used frequently and the uh, usual number needed to treat for psychiatric medications is from three to six. That means for every three patients treated one will respond up to for every six patients treated one will respond. Most people think that treatment is more effective than this but this is about as good as we get. Uh, this is uh, the way this is calculated is that the re remission rate of, uh, in a study is uh, you subtract the placebo response from the remission rate and divide it by a hundred and that gives you the, this number here and that allows clinicians to really get an idea of how effective their medications are. We can also do a number needed to harm with various side effects and it's a it's a good clinical way of comparing things. It requires a placebo in the study to do that. Not all studies have placebos. Uh, this Premipexol study by Goldberg was a very small number of patients, but he got a n number needed to treat of close to two, which is, which is unprecedented. But we know that the number needed to treat will be smaller and smaller studies. So. Uh, this is a very interesting finding here. Uh, and you'll see I'm mentioning Premipexol because I'm going to discuss this further. Uh, we found that uh, some people think that Premipexol is more effective in bipolar disorder than unipolar. I'm not among that group, but there have been some findings here about that. And the dosage of Premipexol varies from 1 milligram to 2.5 milligrams in these studies. You'll notice when I give you, show you my cases that I went much higher, uh, a dose higher than this in some patients. Now here's the question about dopaminergic medications. First of all, what does a dopaminergic mean? It means that the medicine increases brain dopamine function in the brain. Now dopamine is an important chemical that affects uh, your, your, your motor movement. You see in Parkinson's patients, Parkinson's disease patients are losing their, their dopamine neurons for some reason that we don't understand yet. Uh, and so they lose their fluid movement and, and have stiffness. But they also have a high rate of depression. And the reason for that is that one of the dopaminergic tracts in the brain that's very important is the one that gives us our motivation. Our motivation is what makes us pursue happiness. And without motivation, no happiness is pursued. So 
here are the medications. This one is known, uh, uh, the brand name is Wellbutrin. You may have heard of this drug. It's widely used, but it has only a 22% affinity for the dopamine transporter that makes it very weak uh, on dopamine. This is the most widely used dopaminergic drug in psychiatry right now. The second most is aripiprazole, which is actually a, a, a Bilify. You, you see it advertised on your television uh, to augment antidepressants because it's approved for that and it's still on patent, so it's still very expensive. Uh, this drug is a partial dopamine agonist, and it does seem to increase dopamine effect when you add it to antidepressants. And it does help many patients who are not responding to usual antidepressants, which usually affects serotonin or norepinephrine. Uh, the drug modafinil is, is sold commercially as Provigil, and it's, a, it's an alerting drug. Uh, it's, a, it's a very weak stimulant, but it does seem to work in bipolar depression in some patients with uh, bipolar depression uh, get, respond to this drug that don't respond to other medications. And then you have your stimulants, dextroamphetamine. And this is the reason that the uh, chemical industry, the pharmaceutical industry, has probably stayed away from dopaminergic drugs. This drug can be abused, but it does help when it's added to other antidepressants. But it does it by causing a surge of dopamine, which means you have to repeat the doses over and over again. Then lastly, we have the drug Premipexol, which is a D3 uh, autoreceptor agonist, uh, which increases dopamine tone in the brain. In other words, it increases, it tells the dopamine neurons in your brain to fire at a higher rate. Uh, it was used to treat Parkinson's disease event originally uh, for the motor symptoms. In other words, these patients are losing their, their dopamine cells and they're, they're having trouble walking, they're, they're stiff, and uh, the uh, Premipexol helped with this. It also uh, regenerates uh, dopamine cells in the brain. It has a protective effect, neuroprotective effect, and a neurogenerative effect, which is very good. Now, what was seen in these patients with Parkinson's disease is not only did their, their uh, their illness as far as coordination get better, but their mood also improved. And that led someone uh, uh, to try it in depression without Parkinson's disease and find that it worked. The interesting thing is that this drug is off patent. There's no money to be made off of it, and almost nobody uses it for depression right now maybe 1% to 2% of psychiatrists would, would even know about this drug uh, because it's not, it's not uh, marketed at all. Now, what do I mean by treatment resistance? You, you, you were probably asking that question in your mind. Uh, treatment resistance is, is defined operationally by the number of adequately received treatments that have failed to produce a response or a remission. A response is a 50% decrease in, in the patient's symptoms. The FDA uses that in their studies. But remission means that the patient has hardly any symptoms left of their depression. And we're now using remission as our preferred outcome. Uh, I don't think this is adequate either. I think we should be using recovery, which means that the patient not only gets better, it goes into remission, but stays well for six months because a remission for a few weeks isn't going to make a person very happy. Now, in treatment refractory patients, these are the medications, the abbreviations for the medications that are frequently used. SSRIs are the drugs like Prozac, uh, Zoloft, Paxil. Uh, they are the most uh, commonly used drug to treat depression because they have the least side effects. Uh, then there are the SNRIs that uh, increase both, th these increase serotonin in the brain. These increase serotonin and norepinephrine, that's where the N is for here. And there's only two of those 
uh, right now. And that, that one is uh, Effexor or Venlafaxine, and the other is Cymbalta or Duloxetine is the, is the, is the generic name for it. Uh, so there are maybe four or five of these, maybe six, and there are about two of these. And then your tricyclics are the old, are the drugs we used to use before the SSRIs came out. And sometimes they'll work when, when these don't work. And then you have uh, ECT, uh, which is the electroconvulsive therapy for the patients that are not responsive to treatment or who are extremely ill, uh, are suicide risks, and you need a response that's reliable and quick. ECT is, is good for that. Sometimes people use monoamine oxidase inhibitors, MAOI, and, uh, and these drugs are very effective. Sometimes they're as effective, is effective as, as ECT or more effective, uh, and it's a question which to use. Many patients uh, want to put off ECT. It's, uh, it's a procedure where you have to take an anesthesia, you have you can't be you have to be driven to the treatment uh, because you you're having your post anesthesia. You have to have a series of anywhere up to twelve of these, maybe given twice or three times a week. Uh, it's a big deal to have a course of ECT. Uh, sometimes people will elect to go ahead and try MAOIs first. Uh, if if a patient is treatment refractory, it means the patients had all these treatments and they're still not better. And, and there are patients like that. Uh, most studies uh, uh, in the literature consider a treatment resistant patient a failure to respond or remit with two medications of differing mechanisms, such as an SSRI and an SNRI. Uh, a drug that I left out here is Wellbutrin, which is um, which is the mild dopamine drug that I mentioned before. Uh, I'm going to present you some cases here uh, of patients who are resistant, chronic treatment resistant patients, and how they, 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 their treatment uh, played out. Now, you're going to see a lot of medications listed. I'm not going to read them all off to you. And, it, and it's not specifically important for this purpose to, uh, to go over each treatment. Um, it might be in a clinical presentation to other psychiatrists, but what I want to uh, get across to you is the number of treatments that failed in these cases uh, before they got better. And that's the point I'm trying to make here with this case. So this is a 63-year-old male that I first saw and, and 2003, and it's interesting, I've been following him ever since. So I followed this man for 11 years. Uh, when you follow a patient for a long time, you really see how things work because uh, events happen in their lives and, and, uh, and you, you get relapses and recurrences. And, and so long-term follow-ups are very useful, but most studies don't, don't measure that they measure their response in 8 to 12 weeks of treatment. The FDA, that's what the FDA does. So this is a very different perspective. So this man presented here with the following symptoms. Now I'm going to point out here that he's anhedonic. What does that mean? It means that he does not experience pleasure. When something good happens, it doesn't make him feel good. And he doesn't seek pleasure. He's got a decreased appetite. He's got absent libido. All these things go along with anhedonia. Uh, and he's got a poor concentration in memory, which is also, these are all dopaminergic functions. The, the uh, anhedonia, the decreased appetite, the absent libido, the poor concentration in memory are all related to dopamine function in this patient. He was hospitalized back in 1973 for seven months. So he's had a long-term depression. And here are the various treatments that he's had. Here's his prior treatment. Tranylcypramine is Parnate, which is an MAO inhibitor. And that's a fairly high dose. 
and he had this without help, plus this is an SSRI, plus a stimulant. Uh, then we, uh, we, uh, we tried some various treatments here. You might recognize Provigil, uh, Lexapro is a, a, an SSRI, nortriptyline is a tricyclic. So then he had a course of ECT because these weren't helping him uh, in, in, uh, in 03. And he improved for a short time but relapsed within a month or two. Then was treated with these drugs. And I'm just going to go through this because I don't want to take too much of your time with, with this kind of detail. But I just want you to see the number of treatments. Here's a number, another uh, set of ECT treatments given to this gentleman uh, because he wasn't responding to treatment. So he's had two courses of ECT, which, uh, which didn't, gave him some improvement but led to relapse. So um, I, began, I began with this patient, an MAO inhibitor called phenylazine. He'd already failed one called tranylcypramine or parnate. This one's called Nardil as a brand. And I gave him this, this because some patients fail one MAOI and respond to another. And this man, gentleman, went into full remission initially. But he had a few things go on in his life, such, such as surgery for prostate cancer. Uh, and but he essentially stayed well with some tweaking. Uh, I added some methylphenidate, which is a stimulant to increase his energy here. Uh, but you can see from 05 to 07, he did pretty well. He had to have this adjusted. In 07, he took a vacation and took a cruise to Panama, which I thought was pretty good uh, for a patient who's horribly depressed. He stayed in remission uh, through 09. Uh, in 09, he, he had some memory loss from his ECT, and he, and he uh, would, would fail to refill his methylphenidate, and he'd stop that, and he'd have recurrences when he'd stop his medicine. When I'd get him back on the medicine, he'd remit. He'd be back in the remission uh, through 11. And you can see this is a long treatment, but essentially, uh, he, stopping methylphenidase resulted in three brief relapses, but starting again brought him back. So it, between the phenylazine and methylphenidate, this man, uh, this man had, has, has been well most of the time except when he stops his medicine. So even though he failed two ECTs, he, he responded to MAOIs which um, MAOIs increase all three neurotransmitters, dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine. So these are one of the few drugs that increase dopamine, and he responded to this combination. Methylphenidate also releases dopamine and increases it in the brain. So between that and the MAOI, this man has had a life for now uh, about nine years. I want, to, I want to show you this patient who uh, is a 54-year-old male, uh, chronic depression for 13 years. Um, this man has some bipolar disorder, hypomanic episodes. Uh, he, he had a lot of, of alcohol, uh, drug abuse problems when he was younger. Uh, he's got a family history of bipolar disorder. You can see that in his maternal side. Uh, bipolar disorder does run in families. Uh, he's had suicidal ideation, but no suicide attempts. He's been hospitalized five times, the last time two years ago. Uh, he's essentially been severely disabled since 1983. So this, this man is very treatment resistant also. Um, he'd had two courses of ECT. This is the ultimate treatment, no help. He had MAI inhibitors and with no help. Um, he'd failed a series of antidepressants here and, and mood stabilizers. Here's the, the stimulant methylphenidate. It didn't work. Modafinil didn't help. Um, he's uh, essentially living in bed all day uh, with, 
with really no life. Uh, so we got them. Uh, Catiapine, you'll, you noticed I pointed out, had some antidepressant effect in bipolar patients. So I tried that. I tried uh, a tricyclic, augmenting with dextroamphetamine, no help. Now what do I do? Well, we started with clomipramine, which is a very powerful tricyclic drug. Uh, he got some initial improvement, but then he had some recurrence. He had another course of EC, another 12 ECT. Uh, he had uh, uh, some a VNS, vagal nerve stimulator implanted, uh, which stimulates the brain and which helps some people with treatment-resistant depression. His um, this is his clomipramine dose. Uh, he had a recurrence in his depression. Uh, uh, he was responding to clomipramine for a while. Uh, we added some Abilify for augmentation. I mentioned that before. And you can see um, he's still getting better and worse and better and worse. So he was still depressed and, and by uh, 2010. So I added Premipexol. This is the dopaminergic drug that I talked about before. He was a little bit tired, so I added some dexedrine, which actually increases dopamine with a surge. It's a little misspelling there, but it's clear. And uh, he's improved. And he main, he's main, essentially maintained that improvement for the whole time. Um, for the last four years, he's essentially lived a, a, a full life. He's had some problems with hepatitis C, which would give you low energy. Uh, that's from the drug abuse, from the IV drug abuse. And, but you have a response here from 2010 to 2014 on Premipexol, 3 milligrams. So that's the point of this patient, a four-year remission. Here's a woman that came from Pakistan, a, a physician who retired. Uh, uh, she, uh, her daughter had married a surgical resident in New Mexico. That's how she found out about me and came to see me. Uh, her father had a history of bipolar depression and ECT. Depression in the mother, you can see a fam positive family history. She'd been depressed when she came to see me for two years. Uh, it looks like her daughter leaving her and, and moving to the U.S. had something to do with their depression. Here's her symptoms. Uh, low energy levels, total anhedonia. Uh, those are the symptoms that are dopaminergic in this patient. In other words, when dopamine is depleted, you see low energy and you feel, and you see this is, uh, means inability to experience pleasure. Okay. Um, she had a lot of anxiety as well with this depression, and many depressions do. So she'd had a prior episode of depression after two miscarriages, a second episode in 1997, which, which responded to treatment. Uh, she'd, uh, she again re relapsed was hospitalized for five days, was given intravenous clomipramine. We don't even do this in the United States, uh, followed by the clomipramine is a very powerful antidepressant. Another cor a course of 7-ECT, uh, and uh, then we tried a, a bunch of other medications. Nothing worked. Now what? Now what do we do? Well. I had her, uh, she was going to be in town for six weeks, and I thought she was probably going to need MAOI treatment, but because I'd been using more Premipexol, I decided to, to start Premipexol along with venlafaxine because she couldn't remember that she had, had had an SNRI, which she had had, but I didn't know this at the time. Uh, and I incre rapidly increased her, her Premipexol and Essentially, two weeks later, she was in full remission. Full remission in two weeks. Well, 
What do, what, do, what do you think when a patient goes into remission in three weeks? She was on three milligrams of premipexol. The question first is, is this a placebo response? I, after all, she took a trip to the United States to see a special doctor, uh, a pretty dramatic uh, thing, and you got this very rapid response. But two weeks later, she's still better, and at four months, she's still better, uh, and she uh, goes, uh, she goes home and comes back from Pakistan, she's better. At seven months, she's still better, but she now she has some mouth, ul mouth ulcers. Now, she's a doctor, and she decided that the medication may have caused these ulcers. Uh, I don't think that's likely, but uh, she concluded this, and she, uh, here's an email from Pakistan, anxiety goes, remission persists, uh, and I saw her again in June of 212, and she had reduced her Premipexol and uh, tapered off of it and reduced her venlafaxine, but she was still well. So this woman had a lasting remission. Uh, thus far, I haven't heard back from her uh, and uh, off of Premipexol, but it was the Premipexol that put her into the remission. So that's all these cases have failed ECT. There's another one, uh, a 56-year-old married male, a lawyer, musician. Uh, he's got a long-standing treatment resistant. Uh, he was referred to the resident clinic that I supervise, and he had a chronic, unrelenting depression starting at 16 years of age. And here are his symptoms, amotivation, uh, anhedonia, thought slowing. These are all dopaminergic symptoms, amotivation, anhedonia, thought slowing, decreased concentration, libido. Uh, uh, these are those symptoms that I just pointed out are dopaminergic symptoms. Uh, he had a history of uh, some substance abuse with alcohol, uh, had treatment in a rehab when he was young. Uh, he had binged from 50 to 51, stopped again. So he had a, a comorbid uh, alcohol abuse, which is not uncommon in, in depression. Uh, he had some cognitive behavioral therapy as a teenager. Uh, and here's a bunch of medical medication trials, which I'm not going to read, but you can see all the medications he had that didn't help him. Uh, He'd had uh, ECT, nine ECT with about 25% improvement, which was not maintained. Uh, and uh, we, we gave him other treatments here. And uh, eventually, we put him on Premipexol right here in 2012. Uh, we uh, increased it to 4.5 milligrams fairly high dose, uh, and he started to show some improvement, uh, but we weren't satisfied with it, so we were considering a MAOI, but then we uh, we put him back on Premipaxol because that didn't work out, and uh, you see we increased the Premipaxol to 5 milligrams here in 2013, and in 2013, uh, a very interesting thing, he was doing very well, conducting musical pieces, finishing uh, compositions, writing multiple instruction books. Uh, he was, he'd become a full-time musician and was very happy with this. And when he suddenly had a cardiac arrest in his doctor's office. Now, a cardiac arrest should lead to death, but he did it. He had it in his doctor's office, which saved his life because he had a pacemaker implanted. He had a uh, arrhythmia that he didn't know he had, a cardiac arrhythmia. Uh, there is a new resident treating him who didn't know about, didn't know much about Premipexol and discontinued it because he thought his, it could have caused his cardiac arrest. Uh, there, are, there are no such uh, symptoms related to Premipexol, but he didn't know this, and so he was being careful. And um, 
the man had a total recurrence of his depression, and he was put back on Premipaxel, and he got back to his prior prior uh, productivity, and he's doing fine on Premipaxel alone now with no other antidepressants. So he's another person. There are two additional cases, a 67-year-old female with chronic depression who failed ECT. Uh, first time we started Premipexel, she was able to have sexual orgasms for the first time, um, able to laugh and joke, and, and then full remission. This 25-year-old medical professional uh, had a history of failing 30 to 40 ECT with no help, or no help. Uh, he was on an MAOI, Selegiline, which is a patch, which is uh, this man had a plan to order a helium canister to kill himself. Uh, he was told by a doctor his case was hopeless, which is a terrible thing to tell anyone. He had a very high depression score. The highest you can get is 27. And it went down to 6 uh, when he was put on Premipexel. So this young man did very well on Premipexel so far although it's an early response. Well, I've mentioned anhedonia a lot, and it's one of the symptoms related to dopamine depletion. And uh, the DSM-5 de de defines this as markedly diminished interest or pleasure in all or almost all activities most of the day, nearly every day. Uh, dopamine depletion decreases anticipatory pleasure. In other words, uh, the person's ability to want to do something is decreased. And their perception is that there's just too much effort to do anything. It's hard to believe this, and most people can't understand it when a person's depressed, that they feel it, that it's just too much effort to do anything. They think they should just get up and run around the block and they'll feel better, but it's not quite that simple. Uh, that's what we do when we're when we're down because things have gone against us, but not when you have a depression. It doesn't do it by itself. So I wanted to tell you about uh, Dr. Treadway's rats. Uh, this is studying dopamine, the effect of dopamine. Now I'm focusing down on this. Uh, what he did is uh, put these rats in a tea maze where they could either eat crappy rat chow, which is what they usually got, or they could press a bar 20 times, wait for 20 seconds, and get a luscious biscuit. And the rats learned very quickly to do this. But when they knocked out their gene for dopamine, they stopped pressing the bar and ate the crappy rat chow. Then he gave them a chemical to restore their brain dopamine, and guess what? They went back for the good stuff for the bar press. So dopamine gave them the energy to obtain positive reinforcements. And this is what it does in our brains. So dopamine affects what's called decisional hedonia. This is the ability to want something bad enough to do something to get it. And this is what dopamine does. And if you see a person uh, with depression, they frequently not, not always, but frequently, uh, have severe anhedonia and severe lack of ability to, of, to initiate activities. Now, I had the opportunity to film these two 45-ton whales. Uh, these are humpback whales. They both breached simultaneously off the boat, and I just had a camera in my hand and got this picture. Think the effort it takes for these animals to lift 45 tons out of the water. What allows them to do it? It's probably dopamine in their brains. They're probably getting some fun out of it. They certainly look to me like they're having fun. Uh, I don't know what they look like to you, but they look to, to me like they're having fun. Maybe they're getting rid of some barnacles too, but I, they must be having some fun, and it takes a hell of a lot of effort to do this. We also saw some gray whales, and, and uh, this is a baby gray. And my wife, Katie, is petting the whale because the mother 
who weighs 30 tons. This, this one only weighs five. It's a little baby. Uh, they, are, they come over and they want to make contact with us. They're not coming for food because they don't eat what we have. They, have, they only eat plankton. But these whales actually wanted to come and see us. And the mothers are underneath them presenting them to us. Uh, very interesting interaction with another intelligent species that we had. And the question is, whose dopamine tone is higher, the whales or my wife's? So this is Premipexol, the drug I've been talking to you about. We use PPX as an abbreviation because it's such a long name. Uh, we, we, th this is what I've learned by using it. The dose tolerance and requirement increases with age, which is the opposite of most drugs. Most people tolerate drugs less in dose as they age. And this is the opposite. And it probably is because as we age, we're probably losing some of the dopamine neurons in our brain. Uh, the, when, when one is treating these patients, you want to increase the dose as fast as you can, but you don't want to give the patient side effects and have them discontinue. So there's a, a tension between increasing the dose and, uh, and getting the response fast enough so the patient doesn't give up on you. Nausea and sleepiness. Uh, uh, can occur and it may remit after seven days. So you have to try and talk the patient if they get these side effects, not all of them do, into staying on the medicine or backing down the dose and waiting. Uh, I find that giving all the medicine at night is um, reduces the side effects and the rejection rates. Uh, and uh, the, the dose required for response is highly variable from person to person. You have to find out. Um, we don't know if it works better with other noradrenergic antidepressants like Effexor. Uh, I, I've certainly given it with them and seen responses. Uh, some patients may fail stimulants. They may not respond. But after primipexol, they may respond to stimulants additionally. Uh, patients. Uh, after they've been well for a while, seem to have a high rate of discontinuation without a relapse. Uh, and there is a possibility that these patients don't need as much dopaminergic uh, tone from the medicine after a while, that, they, that their brains become more normalized and they don't really need it. Uh, this drug causes a regrowth of dopamine neurons, so it's a very healthy drug for the brain. And uh, as I told you, nobody knows about this drug because it's not advertised. And it's cheaper than dirt. It's a, it's a generic drug. Uh, here are the studies. Uh, and uh, here are the side effects. Uh, there have been some increased compulsive behaviors and pathological gambling uh, reported in Parkinson patients. And we have to assume that could occur in psychiatric patients. When I tell my depressed patients I could get a sex addiction, uh, they laugh at me because most of my depressed patients have no sexual uh, libido at all. Um, and uh, the doses are usually around 3 to 5 milligrams by the time uh, you get a response. Uh, there are some downsides. Uh, there is a dopamine withdrawal syndrome. I tell my patients never to stop the drug. If, it's, if you're going to go off it, you should go off of it gradually. And you, one can get these symptoms by stopping it suddenly. So you need a person that listens to you and will comply with your instructions. Uh, this is another uh, a study uh, that I've done with monoamine oxidase inhibitors showing that 39% remitted after failing uh, 6 to 12 prior medication treatments. So MAOIs, which are dopaminergic also, uh, are things that should be used more. These drugs are not used because people fear the side effects. Well, here's 88 patients, and one patient 
had a reaction to soy sauce uh, and uh, was, was well after a while out of 88. So we had we had a, a pretty low rate of side effect in these uh, in these patients. So we should be using more MAOIs and we should be using more Primipexil. And uh, this is a summary. Uh, and I think we should be using more dopaminergic medications in these treat-resistant patients is the, is the conclusion. Uh, and uh, I'll stop there for any questions. Um, thank you, Dr. Fawcett, for an excellent presentation. Um, and thank you for all the work that you've done. We, we do have a number of questions. Um, I'm sure. <laughs> and, yes, <Good. laughs> exactly. Um, and uh, one of them, um, I think, is, there's a number that are similar. And one of them um, states that um, he or she is a is a desperate parent of a adult child um, in the late twenties who've had multiple medications and ECT and uh, still not doing well with suicidal thoughts. Um, right. What should such a person do? A uh, person should get a con should get a consultation with the best clinician they can find, and a good way to do that uh, is to call one's local medical center, medical school, uh, and uh, call the Department of Psychiatry and ask who the best psychopharmacologist they can refer you to is, and this may. This may be uh, involve some expense, but even a consultation might give you a st uh, uh, some ideas uh, for treatment. That um, many many doctors, after they've given a number of treatments, uh, run out of ideas, and uh, different doctors might have different ideas. So a, a second opinion is very important to get. Uh, and most good doctors will not object to a second opinion if they're uh, if they uh, are confident of their own ability. Uh, some will because of ego issues, but people should not let that stop them in getting a second opinion. I think that's the most important thing they can do. Okay, good, very helpful advice. And a number of people asked about you know how do they get treatment with PPX. Well, I think if they see a doctor who is a, 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 a expert psychopharmacologist and mention it to him, even if he's not doing it, he'll look it up and, uh, and try it. Uh, uh, I don't, I mean, I think this, this should be used much more widely than it is, and it's just because I'm not a pharmaceutical company that I can't get it used, I can't advertise it. Uh, uh, I think that uh, many many of the best psychopharmacologists will know about the work and uh, and will consider it. Uh, but again, I think one when you have a treat resistant depression, you need somebody who's uh, who's uh, the very best in the area to look at that patient. And, and you the way to find that out, I think, is to go through uh, medical centers, uh, university medical centers. The, one of the questions that were that was asked um, related to acting out on suicidal ideation and in the context mm -hmm. of the tragedy of Robin Williams, right. what's been your experience in terms of PPX and other medicines um, and the risk of acting out on suicidal ideation? Well, the 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 greatest risk, uh, if, if statistically, is in people under 25. Uh, the FDA has found that older people have actually lower rates of suicide attempts, but uh, young people under 25 can have increased suicidal behavior. Uh, nobody has shown increased suicides, by the way. What they've shown is increased attempts or preoccupations, which is dangerous. There's no question about it, but it's not the same as showing increased uh, suicide attempts. Most of the studies of adolescents' uh, suicides show that most of them have no antidepressants in their blood because they're not taking them. 
non non-compliance is very common in adolescents. They hate to take medication, and they often don't, uh, even though the parents may think they are taking it. So. Uh, I think that uh, it, it is a risk in young people. It has to be discussed. It has to be up front. Uh, but we know that uh, when people give less antidepressants to younger people, there's some evidence that the suicide rate goes up. So we know that the balance effect is positive. The, uh, the evidence on, uh, on suicide prevention with medications shows that there's no evidence that short-term treatment will prevent suicide. Uh, and that's come from meta-analyses of, uh, of the rates of suicide on placebo versus drug in the FDA studies. There's no difference in, in 8 to 12 weeks. But uh, a long-term follow-up study, and that's what it takes of 45 to 48 years, has shown that patients who are on their medication for at least six months out of 44 years, at least that, they could be on it for more, show a, a reduction in suicide rate. And these are highly suicidal patients admitted for, for depression of it originally, uh, both bipolar and unipolar. So I think that the idea is to get the person to stay on their medication uh, to reduce the risk of suicide once they've responded. and uh, and. And you also have to get the person better. And that's why I gave this talk, because I think that one of the things we're missing is dopaminergic treatment. I want to ask a little bit about um, bipolar and depression. Mm -hmm. and sure. And what, you know, what's the differences in the approach to that? Well, as I said in the talk, uh, you know, for many years it was the, the, the bipolar depression has never been approved for treatment with antidepressants. They've all been approved for major depression. Now, bipolar patients get major depression, and so the assumption has been that it's the same thing in, in bipolars as it is in unipolars, except for the fact that sometimes antidepressants without mood stabilizers can lead to the person mood cycling. That makes it more complicated, and it means that you need to, to uh, have a patient with bipolar mood stabilized, or they're going to get depressed. If, if their mood goes up, it's going to go down. I mean, uh, bipolar patients like to think that their manias are separate from their depressions, but they're really part of the same disease process. And you have to have mood stability to have anything in a bipolar patient. So the mood stabilizers have to be effective first. If they're still depressed, then you have to treat their depression. And the question is, do tricyclics, or, or the, I'm sorry, do the usual antidepressants, uh, the SSRIs, SNRIs, work? Well, they work in some patients, but they probably work less than they do in major depression. That seems to be the evidence. So we need other treatments. And, uh, and the other treatments may be, uh, for some patients, there may be a role for Premipexol uh, if they failed other treatments. Uh, uh, there's certainly a role for MAO inhibitors. People are afraid of these, but the, the dietary problems with MAO inhibitors have been vastly overblown in the internet. And uh, uh, people just keep expanding the problem. Uh, they're not as hard to use as people think. They take expertise, but uh, but they're not that dangerous uh, in the hands of someone who knows what they're doing. Uh, you do need expert uh, treatment with the treatment-resistant patient, I believe. And, and I think that's the problem. And that's why people should ask for a second opinion if they're not responding to treatment. Well, this is ex all extremely important information. And I think out of everything, the most important take-home message that you provide is don't give up. That if somebody Never give up. Treatment, There's always something that can up. help. Yep. I always tell my patients, if you don't give up on me, I'll never give up on you. And uh, by giving up on me would be committing suicide, of course. <laughs> right. And right. I treat many suicidal patients, and I tell them that, that I'll never give up 
We'll just keep trying things until we get the, the right thing. I think one one thing I'd like to add for the audience, if I could, is that yes. we, we talk as if depression is one illness, but uh, that's because we're using old-fashioned 19th century diagnostic criteria. Even the DSM-5 is, is included in that. What we're finding out from cancer research is that these illnesses are, are very specific, and there may be, like, the depression may be five to twenty different illnesses that we don't that have the same overlapping symptoms, and so when you treat a, a treatment resistant depression, you have to give different mechanism treatments. Uh, you're set, you're so, you're shooting in the dark, but you keep trying until you find one that works, and uh, and never giving up is the is certainly the mantra. Great, great advice. Um, I want to thank you so much, Jan, for the work that you're doing, for sharing this with our audience. And I want to thank our audience for joining us today. The Foundation, through its research grants, is dedicated to improving the lives of people with a wide variety of psychiatric conditions. And I thank everybody on this webinar for joining us in that mission. All of the research we fund is made possible through private donations. So if you'd like to make a gift, please visit bbrfoundation.org or call 1-800-829-8289. This webinar has been recorded, so if you've missed any portion of the presentation or would like to share it with family or friends, please visit our webinar page at our website. I hope you'll join us next month when we hear from Dr. B.J. Casey of the Will Cornell Medical College. She will speak about early life stress, long-lasting impact on brain circuitry and behavior on Tuesday, September 9th, 2014 at 2 p.m. And if you're in the Washington, D.C. area on September 16th, we invite you to join us for the Foundation's upcoming conference, Discovery to Recovery, A Path to Healthy Minds. Um, for more information about this, Again, please visit our website. I want to thank you all for being with us today. And again, thank Dr. Fawcett for your work and for your presentation. Take care, everybody. Thank you very much. Right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.